Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel. I am Efraín Castillo and today we're going to talk about the prolonged use of gabapentin. I chose this topic because it has a very uh, big impact in the geriatric population. It was published in the Journal of American Geriatric Society in December 2022 because it, there has been an increased tendency of prescri prescribing gabapentinoids in post patients especially affecting the elderly population. First, we have a clinical case of a 60-year-old male with diabetes mellitus, hypertension, smoking, peripheral artery disease, who underwent, underwent a below-the-knee amputation due to gangrene. He presents with pain, a very marked pain, in the region with a severe anxiety after the surgery. What is the maximum dose for treating this condition? 50 milligrams, 1,200 milligrams, 2,500 milligrams, or 3,600 milligrams daily. Second, we have a 60-year-old woman who has had pain in the right inframemory region for four months already. Four months ago, she had uh, clusters of vesicles and rash, erythematous rash, and a burning pain. However, the vesicles already have cleared up, and the pain is persistent to the level that it disturbs her sleep, and it increases with activity. What is the most likely adverse effect of the indicated drug to control the pain of this patient? A. Pedal edema, B, hallucination, C, insomnia, or D, autotoxicity. So we're going to talk about gabapentin. It is part of a group of drugs called gabapentinoids. Um, it, there is pergabalin and gabapentin as part of this group, and they're indicated for the treatment of post-herpetic neuralgia. So we are, I put it as neuropathic pain, but it is also used as adjuvant, um, adjuvant therapy for seizure disorders as well, restless leg syndrome, and vasomotor symptoms. However, they both have a lot of off-label uses. That's why maybe uh, there is an increase in prescription of these drugs. It is a GABA analog. However, it doesn't really bind to the gamma aminobutyric acid receptors. Instead, they bind to the alpha-2 delta subunit regulating the glutamate release. And we're going to see it here. First, of course, knowing that it doesn't really bind none of them to the GABA receptors. They instead, they bind to the alpha-2 delta subunit of the presynaptic PQ-type voltage gate capsule channels, modulating the traffic and function of these channels. This in turn, what we'll do is uh, try to modulate the release of the excitatory neurotransmitter like the glutamate, of course. And... Uh, how it does it is regulating the influx of calcium in the nociceptic neuron in the presynaptic cleft. So it is important because that's how it's going to go. It's going to decrease the glutamate neurotransmitter availability. So there's going to be decreased pain. But there is also some evidence that um, suggests that the gabapentin also has a if an effect in the decreased activation of the noradrenergic pain inhibiting pathway where in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord and also in the brain so there are many differences between these two drugs the like pregabalin and gabapentin and we're going to talk about gabapentin because it's the one chosen mostly because of its absorption um, it's limited in the small part of the duo duodenum but um it's in the elderly population, it has seen that it has very effects with the smaller increases in the blood concentration, but still, it has many adverse effects. The most common could be these ones here, which I'm going to point out. First, um, sedation, malaise, uh, ulcers, easy bruising, fluid retage, retention, weight gain, allergic eruptions, and in some cases, have to pay attention to stevens johnson syndrome, cholestasis, hepatotoxicity, and dyskinesia and orgasmia. It's important to know and point out that they decrease the respiratory function. So respiratory depression should be something to look at in these patients, especially if they have any renal, any type of renal impairment, because we have to um, adjust the dose, especially when the patient has less than 60 milliliters per minute. Be okay, we're gonna go to the next one here. And I'm, I'm talking about this, and it was in the article that I'm pointing out uh, was published because first, there was a report in the JAMA that in June 28th of 2022, gabapentin increasingly implicated in overdose death. And a lot of the cardiorespiratory depression 
uh, wasn't really pointed as gabapentin side effect. So that's what we have to look for. And second, um, not only in in post in, in post herpetic neuralgia and post operative patients, but also in radicular low back pain, people use it a lot. And the evidence, this one is from the American Family of Medicine Society. It is not really effective. That's why the evidence-based answer is: it's not really. There's not an, a, an a strong and a high-quality, randomized controlled trial that points out that gabapentin is useful. So these two together, we have to to really pay attention to. And the CDC report of the most used, most prescribed prescribed drugs in the U.S. in 2020 said that gabapentin is a tenth most used or prescribed drug in the United States, far above from common drugs like hydrochlorothiazide or simvastatin. So we have to look at that, how many people, a lot of people. Okay, so the rationale of the study, it was primarily that the surgeons, in order to de decrease the use of opioids, the opioid drugs, they have instead used gabapentinoids. And they have taken these measures, but remember, gabapentin also increases the risk of altermentis status, overdose, and death, especially when they're taking with also some opioids. But uh, the evidence, there's very low, very low, and very little known about the long-term use or the effects of gabapentin in older patients. The sample of the article that I'm talking about from the Journal of American Geriatric Society, it was 20% of the Medicare patients and the MedPAR from 2013 to 2018, and the population was adult patients that were 60 year old or older in the outpatient setting without any previous gabapentin use that were subjected to common surgical procedures but not cataracts. The intervention was um, to check if the patients were prescribed, prescribed seven days before the surgery or seven days after the church, gabapentin. So what was the primary outcome? It was this one re right here, prolonged use of gabapentin. How much? 90 days or more after the discharge of a patient. We didn't take, they didn't take into account if the patient on admission was dead, um, on discharge was death, dead, or had to be admitted. The results, uh, they had a, a sample of 17,970 patients, 3% of which of the universe, of the universe, uh, universal uh, sample. They had had a new gabapentin prescription following their surgery. The mean age, the average age was 73 year old, 73 year old, so they was, uh, there were elderly people and the female sex was a little bit more common. What were the frequency of surgical procedures? 45% were due to complete knee replacement and complete hip replacement with 21%. We see this chart from the, from the study that points out that total knee arthro, uh, arthrosplasty and total hip arthrosplasty are the two most common, but also lumbar laminectomy and lumbar laminotomy are, laminotomy are also common. And we can see here the opioids here when they then the gabapentinos were taken with opioids they had a higher higher risk of being pro, uh, prescribed with prolonged use of gabapentin emergency surgery versus not emergency surgeries and the female sex a little bit more common but no there's not like a very big significant difference non-white race versus white race so it was more common in other races other than white and the multivariate analysis pointed that being a woman, having a higher comor comorbidity score, Charleston scale, and having an opioid prescription at discharge, or also having a greater complexity of care, were associated with prolonged use of gabapentin. So that's what we have to check. Whenever we have a postoperative elderly patient, these are the higher risks that we have to really take care. So the answer here will be 3,600 milligrams. This is the maximum dose. 
But we, of course, of course, we have to know that in renal impairment, it, can, it has to be corrected, especially, like I said, less than 60. We can also give, if, if in CKD patients, we have a chart that we can already uh, adjust the dose when the patient has more than 60, when the patient has 30 to 60 ml per, mi uh, per minute, minute, 15 to 30 and less than 15. Look how it decreases. I'm gonna I'm gonna show really quickly here. So if the patient has more than 60 ml per, min uh, per minute, we can give a maximum daily dose of gabapentin of this. 3600. If the patient is starting to have kidney damage, kidney uh, renal impairment, we have to give 1400 at maximum. When there is a very marked decrease, we give the half of it, 700, and we only give 300 in patients who are on, on stage 5 CKD. Key points is the maximum dose. It is effective in also so, uh, some type of anxiety, generalized anxiety disorder, social anxiety disorder, and panic anxiety disorder. Uh, sorry, panic, uh, see, yeah, anxiety disorder. And there are some, like I said, of label uses, uh, nystagmus, infantile, or acquired anxiety and bipolar disorder, and uh, rest like less syndrome. In this patient, we have to get gabapentin for the pain, of course. So. Remember, this patient has, this is like, this is herpes zoster, so uh, the most common side effect we have to give in a patient, we have to give a patient with a porcerpetic neuralgia uh, when they have more than three months of uh, resolution of skin lesions and they still have the neuropathic pain, we have to give uh, gabapentin that this patient probably started on. And the side effects more common are pedal edema, but also they have somnolence, diplopia, like I said, tremors, um, respiratory depression, and others. And the key points of this, I said already, three months at least, and all the side effects that I just mentioned, and the recommendations of this study, uh, or the conclusions are that long-term use of newly prescribed gabapentin after surgery occurred in one out of five patients. How many? 23%. 23%, that's a lot of patients having more than 90 days with gabapentin. And because non-opioid drugs, gabapentin especially, are increasingly used, we have to really be careful to ensure that they are not are, are only used in, in the short term period, not more than 90 days, to avoid, of course, the side effects that we don't want. And more than one in five older adults prescribe gabapentin pose up field prescription more than 90 days, which you have to take care of. And especially among patients with more comorbidities, female sex, and prolonged concomitant use of opioids have a higher risk. This increases the adverse events and polypharmacy risk. So, any questions you have, you can uh, put it down in the comments. See you next time.